Oh my god. I did it again, didn't I? Timestamps are in the description. You know, this is the only Battle Network I never played before this review series, and despite all the hearsay and all of you telling me about it, I didn't know what to expect. Going by my comments, there's no middle ground with this game. It's either someone's absolute favorite Battle Network or... If you've been around here long enough, you know I'm not afraid to play the contrarian. I'm not some pretentious ass. There's a ton of stuff I love that's crazy popular. But I'm not worried about liking things people hate or hating things people like. So I went in with as open a mind as I could. Hell, I wanted to like this game, because for me, that would have made for a more interesting video premise. You'll see how that worked out. I'm warning you now, if you fall into that first category and you absolutely love this game and it means a lot to you for whatever reason, you may want to consider turning around. Because I'm breaking up the brutal honesty for this one. Between playing, researching, scripting, audio, and editing, this game took nearly 100 hours of my life. And I'm going straight for the throat. Spawned in late 2003, which is fitting considering Capcom was fucking up every other series they owned that year, Battle Network 4 continues the asinine decision made by the previous game to split the release into two separate versions, Red Sun and Blue Moon. At least this time there are real differences between the two. Each one features both power-ups and entire sections of the game unique to each. We'll only be playing Red Sun for this video, and all future videos will follow a similar pattern of only playing one of the two versions. There's not really any super strong reason I'm playing Red Sun. You can play whichever one you want. I'm not playing Blue Moon because it has a few potentially catastrophic emulation bugs. I don't just mean computer emulation, I mean all forms of emulation, including the Nintendo DS. Apparently there's 10-20 to 20 minute long black loading screens in some levels, and a chance that one of the later boss areas will just crash the entire game and you won't be able to get past it. I don't know all the details, and apparently there's a couple different patches that can fix it, but just to be safe we're gonna be looking at Red Sun. Which is fine, cause I wanted to play Gregar anyway. Oh, right, let's address that too. From this point onward, the Battle Network games split into two slightly alternate canons, mostly based on which characters appear. On one side, we have Blue Moon, Team Colonel, and Psybeast Falzar. On the other, we have Red Sun, Team Colonel, and Psybeast Gregar. Why is Team Proto Man not canon? You'll have to wait till the next episode to find out. My point is, you should decide if you want to play Gregar or Falzar before choosing which version of Battle Network 4 you want to play. Got it? Good. Let's get started. The story, and it hurts me to call it that, begins with a group of observers at... Naxa. It's gonna be a long day. They've caught readings of a huge meteor heading straight for the Earth, and quickly scramble to gather the experts required to solve this catastrophe. But enough about that, let's go see what everyone's favorite Ethernet cable is up to. Before going anywhere, let's address the brightly colored question on all your minds. What the hell happened to Land's Room? Battle Network 4 is the dividing line between the two different art styles used in this franchise. Games from this point on adopt a more saturated cartoony art style, rather than the more, for lack of a better term, realistic appearance of the first three games. Characters have new emotion portraits, black outlines, and slightly less detail on their sprites thanks to said outlines taking up space. Also, there's what I can only describe as a warm filter over most of the game. All colors skew slightly towards red. It's jarring coming off of Battle Network 3, but you You'll get used to it after a while. I don't think this direction is better or worse, it's just different, and a little bit of a visual shakeup four games in isn't a bad idea. It's kinda rough here, but it gets better in future entries. Oh, Christ, I got sidetracked already. Downstairs, Lan's mom is frustrated that the microwave is malfunctioning, so Lan offers to jack in and see what the problem is. Sure enough, it's a gaggle of viruses. Sounds like as good an excuse for a tutorial as any.
Battle chips. They have codes. Match them. Mega Man can move around. Shoot the buster, but it's weaker than chips. Wait for custom gates to fill up. Repeat. We've gone over this three times already. If you don't get it yet, I don't know what to tell you. There are two changes to the basic system this time. The add function was removed, and the max chip window is now 8 instead of 10. I'm sure there's a reason for that we'll discover later. But when one door closes, another opens. So to compensate for the damage lost by a lower chip count, we have a new feature called the emotion window. There's an ever-present status image of Mega Man in the top left corner by our health. The color and his expression change based on your performance and how the blue bomber is faring overall. The primary purpose of this system, and the most important emotion shift you can trigger, is called Full Synchro. This should sound familiar as it's been referenced in pretty much the entire series thus far. In fact, Mega Man and Land have done something incredibly similar three times prior to this. Different methods were used each time, but the result is essentially the same. When Navi and Operator are perfectly in tune with each other, their spirits meld together and enter a state known as Full Synchro. In Full Synchro, Mega Man will glow and be surrounded by a purple ring, when in this state, all chip attacks deal twice as much damage as normal. This is exactly as busted as you're imagining it is. Full Synchro is achieved by countering, you know that thing that used to drop bug fragments, hitting an enemy with a chip in the few frames when their attack is about to come out. The state is lost after taking damage or any time a battle chip is used. However, by continuing to counter virus attacks, you can chain activations, meaning the mode can technically speaking, last indefinitely. Mixing this with program advances or elemental weaknesses cleverly can melt bosses in seconds. Most of the other emotions are tied to gameplay mechanics we don't have access to yet, so we'll place those on the back burner. Microwaves fucked. I gotta go to the net to buy a repair program. They're throwing us right in this time. Not that I'm complaining, there's just normally more stalling before this point. Hey, data crystals can appear in combat now. If you keep them safe from both your and the virus's attacks till the end of the skirmish, you'll get an additional reward at the end of the battle. Land's dad fixes the microwave, breakfast is had by all, then father and son head down to the station for some shopping, oh dear, what happened to ACDC Town? I'm starting to regret what I said about the art style. The aesthetics are fine, but the design of the areas are garbage. The town has been rearranged, somehow, and also shrunk to half its original size, removing both the school and all the additional houses that made the neighborhood feel complete. And hey, while I'm on a bitching spree, let's talk about how even the words in this game are bad. I take back what I said about Battle Network 2's translation. This game takes that cake and then chokes on it. Every. Single. Piece. Of. Written. Text has some sort of grammatical or spelling error. The Battle Network series has always had a tenuous relationship with proper English, but it wasn't this distracting. What even is this conversation? It's word salad that I'm pretty sure has the wrong character portraits at the wrong times. There's so many electrical store viruses busting? Okay. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop now. Let's, let's get back to work. Lan and Dr. Hikari head down to Electown, an electronics shopping district, to look around for some computer parts you each your own needs. While his dad is off grabbing something, Lan meets up with his friends, Mail and Yai, who are participating in some sort of contest to win a pair of... I said I would stop. While the three chat, Yuichiro pops out of the store to tell Lan he's received a sudden call to an important meeting in Natopia and has to leave right away. No doubt, this has something to do with that whole meteor extinction rigmarole. Well, Lan doesn't have anything else to do today, so he wanders into the square where a crowd is gathered for a special announcement. Um, you sure about that one, Chief? Not only do school children net battle all the time, I've been battling random people on the street for three games now. I hope this is more bad English and not just a glaring lore mistake. Continuity aside, Dentex City is holding a huge televised tournament to determine the best net battler in the region. And no, you didn't accidentally click on the Battle Network 3 video. They are in fact reusing the same plot setup as last time. As he heads back home, Lan catches sight of some worried operators outside his store window. When jacking in to investigate, Mega Man finds the collapsed bodies of several navvies, drained entirely of their power. Uh, 
I'm going to make things easier for you and me and just reveal that this guy's name is Shade Man. And no, he's not just having a really good time. I'm guessing that a similar sound is used to describe Shade Man's verbal tick in the Japanese version. But instead of translating it as re, it was translated as we. <laughs> And this, coupled with the botched script, has the hilarious consequence of making him sound like a dumb toddler instead of a threatening monster. Shade Man flies off to the ACDC area to find more victims, and Mega Man follows the trail of bodies to catch him. Helpful as always, huh, Guts Man? Oh, hi, Glide. You ever gonna do anything in this franchise? We should probably do something about that. Running around ACDC area, we eventually teleport to a completely different region of the net, the computery insides of a huge speaker system in Electown. With no way to reach Shade Man from here, Lan heads back to the shopping district to find a more direct jack-in port. Since we don't want sound waves blowing our heads up scanner style or anything like that, best find some way to block the noise. Hey, that nearby store was holding a competition for a pair of earbuds, right? I guess I'm meant to believe that this computer-obsessed kid who's eternally attached to his PET and whose father invents PETs for a living doesn't own a pair of headphones that attach to it. All I have to do is beat this Navi and, well, eh, look at that. The default Navis have battle forms now rather than just throwing out viruses. That's actually pretty cool. With ears safely covered, Lan can walk right up to the tower's control panel and jack in. I hope you didn't think this game would suddenly turn around now that we're at the first dungeon. Cause you'd be wrong. To get through each room of the Elect Tower, Mega Man has to activate the sonar console in the center of each room, and then look for these invisible bat programs in a very limited time frame. Some of them move in a small pattern, and others just mindlessly flap around the whole area, and you'll have to guess what direction they're in. The real dick kicker here is that random battles are still enabled while you do this. It's just a back and forth trial and error thing. It isn't unbearable, but I wouldn't call it fun either. I know the other Battle Network games have this same problem, but I'm getting tired of being drowned in virus encounters while trying to do challenges or puzzles. It wouldn't have been that hard to turn off random battles when I pressed the switch, would it? No, these guys didn't have their energy sucked by Shade Man. They had to play Capcom's 2003 product catalog. Up, 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 hold the fucking phone. Go back. As one would expect, Shade Man is our first boss this go-around. He warps around a lot, so just wait for him to attack, pop him with an easy counter, and, um... Huh. Usually when I shoot things, they hurt. Thank you. 
So Eugene pops in with Proto Man and takes over this vampire Tom fuckery because it's official net battler business. And it's at this moment I realized that this series has entirely forgotten that Lamb became a top rank official net battler in the second game. Continuity aside. Again, Proto Man chases Shade Man away, but in his hurry, he drops a purple battle chip with an ominous aura. So, of course, Mega Man instantly picks it up, even though it could be poisoned or something, and the brothers leave to go find more information about it. Higsby's a chip expert. I guess I can tolerate him long enough to figure out what this thing is, huh? Higgs identifies the thing as a dark chip. They're like Faustian bargains condensed into a plastic children's toy. They're exponentially stronger and easier to use than even top-tier battle chips, but the evil essence contained within them will corrupt the user's data irreparably. The dark power originates from an area of the net known as Merkland. My guess is that they mean hell, but it was censored somehow. There's no way to know for sure, because there's no location called Merkland in Battle Network 4, so I hope you weren't expecting that plot point to be elaborated on. Higsby orders us to destroy the chip this instant, but Lan doesn't. He says they have to find a proper way to dispose of it. I guess this means the dark chip is data only and can't be turned into a physical chip, so Lan can't just break it. That night at Naxa HQ, Dr. Hikari and a collection of other world-renowned scientists are briefed on the asteroid situation. The meeting has yet to begin as they wait for the last member to arrive, an absolutely above-board and totally-to-be-trusted man named Dr. Regal. He's said to be from Nation Z, some warmongering asshole country, but desperate times and all that. The Coalition decides on a plan that was thought up by Dr. Hikari, firing a huge fuck-off laser at the meteor. Not enough to destroy it, but powerful enough to knock it off course and save the Earth. Another day, another tournament I will assuredly win, provided no colorful group of elemental antagonists decide to show up and ruin everything for the fourth time. After registering our name with a Navi in Town Area 3, we go back to the Electown Square where we can begin the preliminaries, and what do you know, it's a set of three challenges ranging from scavenger hunts to survival battles. Don't roll your fucking eyes at me, you're the ones who wanted more of this. Here, have another hilariously obvious typo that we'll be seeing for the entirety of the game. These purple evil Mavis are called Heel Mavis, spelled like this, H-E-E-L, as in a heel, you know, a bad guy. Let's see how Battle Network 4 decides to spell it every single time. Not even surprised. Putting that behind us, Lan is the last person to qualify, grabbing the final spot for the Density Tournament. So our heroes hop the Metro to the Den Dome and prepare for their first match. Now, before we continue, we need to talk about Battle Network 4's single most notorious feature. Yes, more notorious than the translation. This is going to be confusing, but I cannot possibly explain the rest of the game without you knowing this. The premise of Mega Man Battle Network 4 is a series of three tournaments. Each one has a random assortment of scenarios that you'll be tasked with completing, ending with a battle against a different contestant. Here's the proverbial wrench in the works. There are more scenarios than there are tournament battle slots. So what's the deal here? Are you just not meant to get everything done in one playthrough? <laughs> exactly. In order to see all available story scenarios, unlock all styles, and get all of the chips and upgrades, you have to play Battle Network 4 three times. Three entire playthroughs, with some scenarios repeating themselves just to actually have access to the entire game. I get what they were going for here, but this doesn't give me a feeling of, wow, each playthrough is different. It gives me a feeling of, wow, you, uh, sliced up the content for no reason other than to waste my time. To make things easier, I'm just gonna talk about what happened on my first playthrough for now, then discuss following playthroughs at the end of the video when we get to the minutia of New Game Plus. That way you can follow what's happening without your or my head exploding.
Let's get a closer look at that bracket. I see Gutsman, a Beatles reference, Fireman, who I guess exists again, uh, a boot with a bowl on his head, and three generic navvies. Should be easy pickings. I've never seen someone try the, oh god, you ran me over, I'll sue, thing without, you know, a vehicle. I I'll go on record to say, if a 12-year-old lightly bumping into you breaks your arm, you deserve it. We're, um, saved is the word I'm gonna use, by Tetsu, a generic Japanese biker gang style tough guy. His name means iron, so you know he's a manly man. He leaves, and we immediately follow him towards Elect Town to thank him. But those goons from before are still bugging him. Lan accidentally convinces them to net battle rather than beat the stuffing out of each other, which kinda implies a troubling societal issue of a lesser level of respect for navvies and their own autonomy, but we're not gonna look too deep into that right now. Mega Man comes across their battle where those punks brought an army of 100 heal navvies. Tetsu's navvy has already taken out 80 of them, but is exhausted, leaving the remaining 20 for the little blue guy. And when they say 20, they actually mean it. You just... You just keep fighting. They aren't even slightly challenging. You get no money or rewards for any of these fights, and we can't unlock style changes, so they're just... Oh, come on. Boss cucked for the second time in a row. With no more distractions, Lan and Tetsu ride back to the Den Dome for their match. Okay, that animation was pretty fucking rad. So, time for our first real boss. What are we up against? The same guy we just fought 18 of. Cool. Eh, that's okay. At least we have a new and fresh opponent to look forward to in the next round. The kidnapper only wishes to speak with Lan, not Dex, and issues him a series of three text-based clues. After solving them, we end up returning to the Elect Tower and using the final clue to pick the right prog out of a lineup.
And I was afraid making this counter was a bad idea. Not even halfway in, and the game has already devolved into one of these search the net areas you've already visited for a bunch of things quests. At least the other games waited until the end to spring this repetitive task on me. Five fetch quests later, we have all the data we need. Hang on, you little crotch spawn, I'm coming. It looks like Chisa is safe. No sign of the kidnapper though, and the Todd is being awfully quiet and... If Chisa did all this, I'm deleting this stupid game. He cannot possibly be more than six years old and has no net navy of his own. How could he have possibly set up a scavenger hunt with riddles, commanded a bunch of viruses, and convinced five heal navvies to go along with his plan? And before any of you start, you know who you are. I know he's portrayed as secretly very intelligent in the anti-warrior anime, but this is not the anime. The anime and the games have very different characterizations and plots. Hell, in the anime, Mega Man isn't even Lan's brother, so you really can't use the show as an excuse here. From what we have been shown in the games, Chisao is a drooling toddler who can't even speak properly, not a hidden mastermind. I'm sure you all know my opinion on the ceaseless wave of Gutsman fights this series throws at us. To the game's credit, he does have some different moves this time, an earthquake that causes rocks to fall from the ceiling, and a buster of his own. None of that saves him from the fact that if you just stand far away, he can't hit you. What the heck does that mean? Ah, thanks mystical plot email. Glad you're still here. If you recall, Mega Man sacrificed himself to save Land from Alpha at the end of the previous game. While Dr. Hikari was able to restore Mega Man thanks to the backup Land's grandfather kept safe, this resulted in the loss of Change.Bat, a program that, remember, consisted only of a single uncopyable batch file. As a result, Mega Man has lost the ability to style change. But it's been replaced by something just as good, if not better. 
Double Soul or Soul Unison. It's called Double Soul in English, but Soul Unison sounds cooler and is a better descriptor of what's actually happening. Soul Unison is the closest thing the Battle Network series has to Mega Man's original defining power, his copy ability. When Mega Man's soul connects to that of another Navi, he becomes able to temporarily borrow their spirit to aid him in battle. By sacrificing a corresponding chip type, the selected Unison will activate for three turns, and you can only use each Unison once per battle. Using Gut Soul as an example, it's activated by sacrificing a chip with an effect that damages the field, like Crackout. In Guts Soul, your charge shot becomes a giant fist that pierces an enemy's guard. All non-elemental chips are passively buffed by plus 30, and it also has the returning Guts machine gun, which I still cannot get to work, but that's a me problem. Each version of the game has its own set of six soul unisons. The souls in Blue Moon are Aqua Soul, Number Soul, Metal Soul, Wood Soul, Junk Soul, and Proto Soul. As for Red Sun, the version we'll be playing, well, unlike the style changes, soul unisons are spoilers, so I'll talk about them as we unlock them. Hmm, back to killing time while we wait for the finals match against Top Man. Probably get wrapped up in one of those random scenarios while we do. Oh look, there's one right now! Your taps fucking suck, Grandpa! This old guy is Tensuke, a veteran top maker, and this is his grandson, not impressed, who's absolutely fucking done with his grandfather's chronic top addiction. His top suddenly goes haywire and Mega Man jacks in to repair it, which causes the old man to start shouting about how he could have done it himself, shunny, have some self-respect. If I had made this video a few months ago, this is where the OK Boomer meme would have been. He explains that he would have fixed it himself, but his navi, Top Man, is borked and needs repair. Being a stubborn old man, Tensuke won't accept our help. Maybe he'll listen to his own kind. So we find a net battler club of old folks who agree to help repair Top Man, but only if we fuck your mother. We just did this. <sighs> This is the problem with this random scenario thing. They all have to be doable within the available areas and without disrupting the plot that may or may not be building. So between every tournament match, we're stuck doing filler that by its very design cannot advance the story or introduce new areas because there's a chance you might not get that scenario. Do you realize how boring it is to walk around the same six rooms and fight the same four baby tier viruses for nearly five hours now? This is my problem with Battle Network 2 times a thousand. Endless repetitive busy work in between the parts of the games that are fun and well designed. Only now, it's the game entire premise. Lan and Mega Man locate four of the Elder Navvies, answer their questions, then are given a password to find their leader. We ask said club leader's Navi to set up a meeting with Tensuke, and go wait where else but the Electown Square. Hey, check out the Mario Brothers over here. They bicker for a while, nothing interesting. Eventually, the green one gives Tensuke the guide he needs to repair his navi and hurries off. Land and Mega Man wonder what the rush could be, and oh my god, this game was written by idiots. How is this a surprise? The bracket said our next opponent was Top Man. Who did you fucking think it was? Dex again? Top Man EXE is another easy win. He's also our first original boss fight, finally. He fires off bouncing tops that move like a breakout ball, or turns himself into an invincible top and spins towards you. He's a children's toy from 5,000 years ago, what do you want me to say? With the battle over, Tensuke's grandson respects him again. I guess, 
and what is even happening here? Is the grammar so terrible I can't tell what's happening, or are they getting portraits wrong again? When we next see Lan, he's in the park. It appears the dark chip has been bothering him, and he's been trying to come up with a proper way to dispose of it before something disastrous and plot-related happens. On the topic of plot-related disasters, Mail invites us to go see some weird shit going down in Town Area 3. Oh man, this isn't the bum fight I was hoping for. It's just the announcement of a new theme park named Castillo, opening in Dentec City. Mega Man deletes some viruses for the event organizer, and in doing so wins a pair of passes for the park's opening in three days. Mail drops the hint hard on Lan that she wants the D, but Lan is a shonen protagonist, so he has to be completely clueless as the law is written. Best check our computer and see what's happening here. We were trying to get rid of the dark chip anyway, I suppose. But there's predictably a gate blocking our way. There's no way you guess how we get out of this one. Man, I just wasted a lot of my good guy save the world points on that little charade. Nebula, huh? It's a better name than World 3, I'll give you that. Makes more sense to read, too. Not much we can do about them now, so we should probably just go home. While well, Haruka makes the dinner, Mail calls to ask Lan to accompany her to Castillo the following day. This is when we get an email from Dr. Hikari that contains the Navi customizer. Apparently, Lan's mother confiscated it to discourage him from battling more international criminal rings. A lot of good that did. The Navi Cust hasn't really changed much since Battle Network 3. Place the upgrade blocks on the grid. Flat blocks go on the line. Textured blocks can't touch the line. We're now allowed to use whatever color programs we want, provided there aren't more than four colors active at a given time. As a result, the mod tools are no longer here to fix errors or to input extra codes. Oh yes, why wouldn't something be wrong? 
All the rides in the park are inoperable due to some sort of software bug, and all the navvies that have been sent to fix it aren't coming back out. No rest for the weary. I swear this translation is the only thing keeping me going. The control program just had some viruses blocking it up. Very weak viruses that anyone working at the park should have been able to delete, but viruses nonetheless. With everything working once more, Lan and Mail continue on their date, thrillingly represented by black screens, while supposedly interesting things happen. The last place the pair stop at is the Vampire Mansion, some sort of haunted house inspired by the relatively obscure GBA series Bakura no Taiyo, usually shortened to Baktai. This series is very closely tied with Mega Man Battle Network, and I have no idea why. Battle Network 4, 5, and 6 all have pretty big Boktai cameos in them, including battle chips, post-game materials, and entire areas. Like I said, this haunted house is based on Boktai, and by examining one of the statues you can find a Gundel Soul battle chip. Maybe we'll talk more about these tie-ins some other time. For now, let's get back to the plot. Ah, this feels... right. Land and his friends go to a new area. New area has network-related problems. Mega Man jacks into a puzzle-based dungeon to save the day. I somehow missed this after all those tedious random scenarios. That's what I wrote before I actually started the next part and realized that, oh no, it's very bad. So, pop quiz time, kids. What's the single largest, most objective flaw with this game? Did you say the script that reads like a dying meth head who learned English as a third language wrote it? Because then you'd be correct. Also, strangely specific answer. See me after class. So, what's the worst thing you could possibly have done for a puzzle in such a game? How about a series of made-up fairy tale excerpts with missing words that you have to fill in by running around and finding data chunks? Or to put it in simpler terms, I have to read good when the words are very bad. Basically, this entire chapter is a guessing game because this fourth-rate writing is indecipherable. The very first one describes a princess named Halberd Princess, who's obsessed with her... axe. Why is she called a Halberd Princess if she uses an axe? Is this some kind of joke or Japanese pun I don't get? I'm genuinely curious. Then there's the Wizard Dog, whose rival isn't the Wizard Cat, or even the Wizard Dragon. It's the Wizard Monkey. Every time you get one of these wrong, you have to go back and grab a different piece of word data, then go back to the raft. And there's four of these robots, each with multiple story walls to fill in. Really starting to wonder if those 3,000 subs were worth it. Inside the final animatronic, a vampire with a story based on Bok Tai, I assume, we catch our culprit in the form of Shade Boy. If you could have just blown up the dark chip the entire time, why didn't you do that before?
still unhittable, I see. I tried pretty much everything. No type of chip hurts him. Not the charge shot, not even a soul unison. Eugene appears day late and a dollar short to mop up the mess and warns us about Nebula. Following standard anime escalation rules, he says they're more dangerous than World 3 or Gospel, and that they plan to take over the world and destroy everything through the use of dark chips. Yeah, they're doing an A-plus job so far. You really want to intimidate me? Try fucking up traffic. That was terrifying. <laughs> Despite Lin and Mega Man destroying the dark chip they possessed, its data still managed to sink its fangs into Mega Man. When Mega Man takes a ton of damage in rapid succession, he'll enter an anxious state. In his anxious state, Mega Man is too shaken up to concentrate for a soul unison, and due to his instability, dark chip data will suddenly appear in your folder. These chips are incredibly powerful compared to more or less every other chip in the game, and you don't even have to earn them. Such power is not given freely. Every time you use a dark chip, Mega Man loses 1 HP. Permanently. Extensive use of dark chips can have other nasty effects as well, but we're gonna stay away from them for the time being. Hey, Ma! There's weird fucking strangers at the door again. This dude's here to inform Lan of the Eagle Net Battle Tournament happening soon. He gives us a single battle point to start, and we need 50 to qualify, even though you'd think winning the previous tournament would qualify us automatically. How do we earn battle points? Maybe fighting some rival navvies? Explore a new Netscape? <laughs> Also, we're just walking around previous areas again. Ding. Lang gets 50 points and goes to the site of the next tournament, the castle within the theme park. So I guess you're just a regular character in this series now, huh, Match? Uh, uh, oh, he's just here to argue with the new fire guy, Burn Man, and his operator, Atsuki Homura. You see, that little bitch Match should step the fuck down. He doesn't know who he's dealing with here. Burn Man is the toughest, hottest fire navvy around, because he drove a float a couple times. <sighs> The two hotheads run off to battle each other, and oh, my computer's on fire. That was quick. No. No, no, there's no way. <laughs> there 
there's no fucking way they recycled this stupid chapter again. They added a mini game where you have to press B at the right time, but it's still just the same fucking... <sighs> Lan convinces them to stop with some flawless logic. Lan beat Fireman. So Mega Man is stronger than Fireman. So beating Lan would be just like beating Match. Somebody call up the UFC. I don't think that's how that works. Well, well. It looks like eight hours in, the game suddenly wants me to start trying. I figure this was done to encourage me to use dark chips, as they are more or less instant win buttons. Losing only a single permanent HP in exchange for killing bosses in a single hit doesn't seem like a balanced trade-off. I'll still refrain from using them, but I don't see why I would, outside of the spirit of fairness, I guess. Oh, right, Burnman himself. Burnman.exe isn't a complicated navi as far as techniques go. He shoots fire. Duh. The problem are these two gas canisters that roll across the screen the whole time, and Bunsen burner up your field when they stop. The trick here is to notice that you can manipulate their movement. They always stop when they hit you in the front, but they damage you from the back. It's sort of like a juggling act to keep stopping the two canisters with your face and force them to roll away before they can get behind you. It figures they also block shots, leaving you only the center lane to deal damage. Is someone... someone gonna check on him? <laughs> Another generic Navi? With this generic, reused thug sprite as an operator? If you were gonna bother with this tournament setup, you could've at least designed Navis for everyone. This is gonna seem contradictory, I know, and I know I get on Capcom's case for reusing stuff, but I'd prefer a few returning navvies to just the stock ones. Bring back Iceman or Magnet Man or something, someone from the first two games. I know the point of the Red Sun Blue Moon gimmick is that both versions have different tournaments, but if you only had one game's worth of opponents, you shouldn't have bothered with this different versions thing. Especially when the game is built around multiple playthroughs anyway. Why not just let you select from the two tournaments with a unique navvy in every slot, then do the opposite tournament in New Game Plus? You know, I have no proof of this, but I'm willing to bet the games were originally one title, and the decision was made some point later to split them up, as each tournament has about three unique and three stock navvies. Combine them together and there you go, you get a completely original roster. Back at the plot, man, I say that a lot. We've got another scenario. The tough looking guy is named Riki, and he's not as gruesome as he looks. He's been roped into the Mafia because of his imposing appearance, and entered the tournament to win the prize money and use it to open a bakery to escape this life of skullduggery. His boss, this old lady here, ain't having none of that shit. In fact, she wants Riki to take her place as the head of the Mafia. I don't think that's how that works, but we're gonna ignore it. She steals his Navi to prevent him from competing in the next match and passes it off to her underlings. Unbeknownst to her, the other members of the mob are planning to get rid of both her and Riki, taking his Navi Crusher off to be deleted so he won't get in their way. The brothers step up to help, obvs, which leads to us sneaking around all these Black Heel Navis in the park area. And time for some credit, this area is reused, but this is a new, interesting gameplay style. I much prefer this to searching for random people and things around the net like the last few chapters. 
I mean, it's still got a major design screw up. That being, it's isometric, so you can't see things coming, and the enemy's invisible vision cones extend past where you can see them. So it's more about memorizing locations and patrol routes rather than, like, skill. So how's Battle and Crusher? There's nothing wrong with it. It's just another heal Navi fight. He just has a lot of health now. We're like six bosses in, and there's only been two original ones. Just thought I'd remind you. Roll, huh? She's been seen fighting briefly before, but second best in the country? That's some Dragon Ball Super tier power scaling right there. Roll asks Yai to help her train for her match with Lan. She doesn't want to be alone on the net because some weird Navi has been following Roll around as of late. Oh my god, how does anyone in this universe even function when I'm not around? Roll was captured by some creeper weirdo in the park area, so we go, beat him up, and unlock the door so Roll can escape. Yeah, there was some stupid back and forth across the entire internet, but you knew that already. No point in describing it for the hundredth time. Mega Man points out to Roll how he easily defeated the Navi that grabbed her, and worried for her safety, recommends she withdraws from the tournament. Roll is not happy about his suggestion. To prove her strength, Roll challenges Mega Man to a game of tag. Truly, the contest of champions. This is an incredibly basic minigame that doesn't require any actual effort. Just running around in circles and waiting until Roll randomly warps close enough for you to grab her. Looks like we get to see what Roll's like in an actual battle for the first time. She launches hard arrows as her buster attack, but spends the rest of her time teleporting around the field or summoning Mets. I understand that the teleporting is supposed to represent her agility, but, um... Every character in the game teleports around the field. There's no other movement animation. <laughs> Ugh, Mega Man. Keep it to yourself. Oh, it's just another double soul.
Holy crap, check it out. Laser Man here looks dope as hell. He's all angular and sleek with the neon lights. I can't wait to fight him. I have no more hatred in my body to complain about another Gutsman fight. Let's talk about Rolsol. Say hello to another insanely useful ability that lets you steamroll the game. Roll Soul is like an extension of the Roll Battle Chip featured in the other Battle Networks. By giving up a healing chip, your buster is changed into a crossbow that's not particularly great for virus busting, but is absolutely disgusting in PvP. I can't show you any multiplayer, cause I've got no method of playing it at all, but the Roll Arrow deletes the battle chips your enemy is holding. You think that's crazy? That's the worst effect. The amazing part of Roll Soul is its passive ability to restore HP. Every time you use a battle chip with Roll Soul equipped, you get 10% of your max HP restored. This skill is fucking nuts. In practice, this means you almost never have to waste folder slots on more than two or three healing chips tops, because every chip is a healing chip now. For these reasons, Roll Soul is viewed as extremely cheap and unfair in PvP, and I imagine most people would just elect to ban its use entirely. But we ain't playing PvP, so I'm gonna abuse the shit out of this thing. It's not just me, this Dark Soul thing is weird, right? They're playing up this darkness manifesting in Mega Man's heart from this forbidden power, but I only used the one chip you forced me to use. The story is written in a way that assumes I am at the very least occasionally using dark chips, but I haven't touched them outside of, again, the one time I had no other option. This is gonna bite the story in the ass later. <laughs>
Regal. It's Regal. It's obviously Regal. Fuck Regal. What a dick face. While hanging out on the net with an array of secondary characters, a messenger arrives to cordially invite Mega Man to the Red Sun Tournament. The Red Sun Tournament features a top-tier bracket showcasing the eight best net battlers on the planet. But because we're not playing Blue Moon, Proto Man just isn't going to be there, and they aren't going to address why. The cup is being broadcast from Natopia, meaning we'll need to enter the Den Airport, fuck, Den Airport, to get there. Curse you, GBA tech size limitations. Now, Natopia is the Mega Man Battle Network version of all of the West, basically. It's called Amera in the original Japanese, implying it's a rather cramped fusion of America and Europe. While the Natopia in Battle Network 2 gave off a clear American city sort of vibe, in Battle Network 4, it's just Italy now. Down to the Roman ruins and the Colosseum, which they did not even change the name of, by the way. For fuck's sake, the second Lan leaves Japan both times, he immediately has all of the crimes happen to him. Like, not even people connected to the organizations he's fighting, just random street thugs who want money. So Lan is trapped in this room and is being held for ransom. But holy video game logic, Batman! The guy who yanked us off the street tossed the key fragments around the net, and somehow forgot to take our PET away. Is it a law that every criminal in Battle Network is grossly incompetent? Ah, it's a jape. I guess I take back that stuff I said then. Except the thing about criminals being dumb, because that one definitely holds water. Time to go over to the Coliseum and get the Red Sun Tournament started. Or more likely, we'll see the bracket and then have to go do some hour-long side quest first. So, we're up against a fridge, an umpire, Thunderman, that's Raul's net navy, and Searchman, operated by a man named Rika. Better go wander around Natopia until some sort of scenario activates. This'll do. Hey, hey, looks like somebody finally took my advice. A furious land flies all the way to Sharo, aka Russia, just to get back at Rika. Oh, I get it. Sha, ro, ro, sha, ha ha. Sharo is a small area with not much to look at. It's a freezing little village covered in snow. At the top of the town is a space center that's been helping with the not dying to an asteroid plans. Lan speaks to a staff member who tells him that Searchman is in Undernet 6, sussing out some dangerous members of Nebula. After administering a test, he allows Lan to go in after him as backup.
Undernet 6, huh? This is gonna take a while. The Undernet has always had an interesting appearance, but this is the first time it comes off as the foreboding no man's land it's meant to be. The demonic pathways and monstrous statues give the whole area a hellish vibe. It's easily the best designed area so far. Got the best music too, I love that electric guitar in the background. Oh, I'm getting Jack 2 flashbacks! Eight-year-old me is having some PTSD right about now. So, the trick of this scenario is these crosshairs that follow Mega Man throughout the Undernet. If they catch on to him, you'll have to quickly press the indicated direction, or take a significant amount of damage. I didn't think to check if this could kill you, but I'd like to imagine it doesn't, and if I'm wrong, please just let me dream that they made a good game design choice and pretend I'm right. The Undernet's really fun though. Hell, I'd say it's one of the best areas in the whole series. There's a ton of permanent upgrades here. The final memory expansion for the Navicust, HP memory, multiple customizer programs. It's a great area presentation-wise, and the sniper scope tracking you keeps you from just slinking down in your chair and mindlessly running from place to place. Because everywhere you go, there's either a reward or progress it never feels like you're wasting time. You know, like the rest of the game. Search, man. Fucking spelling. Was the Navi who's been trying to shoot us as we progress through the Undernet as some sort of test. With the threat eliminated and Rika having a tiny bit more respect for Lan, they both fly back to the Coliseum for their match. Searchman.exe is proof positive I'm running out of different ways to describe these boss navvies four entries in. He'll disappear into a foxhole to lob grenades at you, or use his lock-on buster for basic damage. In tandem, these moves can be a pain, as the plush-shaped frag explosions will often prevent you from dodging his sniper shots. You can sort of bait his grenade throws to a more advantageous position, but sometimes he just ignores you and throws it somewhere else anyway. Ugh, Thunderman was eliminated. That's disappointing. Up against another stock Navi now. This one's from...
You know what? I'm taking away the name redacted joke from Yumland. I did that because Yumland is the laziest fucking name I've ever heard, but Netfrica? <laughs> Are you shitting me? Did you even try? A kid comes up behind Lan and introduces himself as Polly, the Netfrican battler who will be fighting in the next round. After some more very professional grammatical mistakes, he invites us to the water festival being held in his village. Nah, that's alright, kid. The match is probably gonna start soon and beans. Unlike every other city or town we've been to, we cannot leave this place until the chapter is done, so no going back to shop for programs or anything. A group of villagers are gathered around a statue, and we're invited to jack in and see what's up. Seems we're just in time for the annual Water God competition to prove the best net battler in the village. The way to win is to be the first to find the Water God statue that flies off to a random net area. It showed up in Sharo last year, so it won't be there again. That's helpful, I guess. That narrows it down, kind of. Mega Man wins, of course, but as we jack out, we find the river, the village's only source of water, has dried up. We're told that the Water God is in actuality a water management and filtration system that's suddenly broken down. Everyone elects that the champion should go and fix it. Like I wasn't gonna get stuck doing it anyway. Inside the Water God comp is a maze of teleporters filled with dead navvies. And it's... it's a maze, alright. As far as I can tell, the order is a complete crapshoot. You're usually on the right track if you see more bodies with more ghosts to fight, but with four warp pads in each room, and around ten correct guesses required in a row, you're gonna be spending a while here, unless you got some crazy luck. Yeah, this game actually made an entire dungeon out of a single room asset. I don't know why I'm surprised at this point. Mega Man finds the main computer, clears out the viruses corrupting it, and we've once again saved dozens of people's entire livelihoods and will surely receive no compensation in return. That's showbiz, baby. Hey, where'd little what's-his-name go off to? Oh, this is another goddamn stall tactic, wasn't it? You know the deal. Basic bastard Navi. Blah blah blah. I'm sorry I tricked you and almost killed my entire town out of jealousy. Next fighter, please. It's that oddball Navi with the mask. Uh, Kendo Man. Yeah. Okay, that makes more sense. Kendo Man's operator is Mr. Famous, and oh damn, I haven't explained who Mr. Famous is yet. Mr. Famous is a world-traveling operator who frequently switches his navi depending on what his current obsession is. His English name, Mr. Famous, I presume is a joke-slash-reference to the fact he's based on the writer of the Mega Man Battle Network series, Masakazu Iguchi. This is more clear-cut in the Japanese version, where Mr. Famous's name is Iguchi Meijin. Meijin being a term to refer to someone who is incredibly skilled. He's been an optional boss for extra chips in the last few games, but he wasn't important to the story and his fights weren't super annoying or anything, so I didn't mention him. Did anybody proofread this game even once? Why is Lan unsure about what Netfrica is? I was just there. This is a result of the stupid scenario randomizer, isn't it? Inaccuracies like this one are more proof that the game didn't have this structure when it was written, and it was forced to be this way later on. Whatever. Mr. Famous says Kendo Man is busy teaching net battlers in Netfrica, and suggests Slan and Mega Man go to see him before the match. The brothers go to the Netfrica area, where they get wrapped up in Kendo Man's bizarre strict training regimen somehow. We have to find three training dummies and beat them with a Kendo sword to pass. Thank the gods this isn't more repetitive net battles. Instead, it's a mini-game where you have to hold the called out direction and press A to strike or block. I like rhythm games, and this is kinda like that, so it's alright by me. Anything different is welcome at this point. Challenge completed. Let's go have our battle with Mr. Famous.
We walk in on an ex-apprentice of Mr. Famous's getting revenge. Revenge for what? Well, he's a bit of a knobhead and Famous called him out on it one time. That's all. The Chud uses the villagers as leverage to beat the shit out of Mr. Famous. Not in a net battle, just beating the piss out of him. This guy's the only sensible person in this entire bass backwards world. Lance sneaks by and jacks into a nearby statue housing four transmitters, controlling the lions, and does that virusy kill thingy we done do. Then Mr. Famous presumably turns his apprentice's anus inside out, and we all go back to Zenotopia. Kendo Man is very weak. He dashes around the field and charges whenever he lines up with Mega Man. It puts the pressure on, sure, but it deals a small amount of damage for an attack so baitable. If you want to slow him down, Roll's arrow shot charges in just a second or two, and it will stun him out of his dash. Arriving at Naxa, Lan is brought up to speed on the meteor situation, and our protagonist is finally aware of the main plot, 14 hours into the game. The scientists have discovered that the asteroid is man-made, or to be more specific, it's artificial, since it was made by aliens. It's powered by a huge computer inside, meaning it has a cyber world held within, that they plan to send Lan into with the help of an unnamed second tournament winner. Maybe it's Eugene, considering he just kind of fucking poofed out of existence after that theme park incident. Before we start the last leg of our mission, Dr. Hikari gives us Red Sun, a Giga Battle chip. See the pinkness? This is the first time we've been given one from a plot event, so I'll touch on them briefly. Giga chips have been around in the series before, making their debut in Battle Network 3. They are almost always the version exclusive chips. Giga chips have insane power, but as a balancing measure, Lan's limited to having a single Giga chip in his folder at a time. What kind of power are we talking about? Well, let's take a look at Red Sun.
I-, I know it was only on a Met, but trust me, that was a very strong attack. It can be upgraded to be even stronger, or so I've read, but only through battling with other people in the versus net battle mode, and there's really no way for me to do that, so this is fine. We should practice with that new soul as well. I completely forgot I earned it. Consuming a hide type battle chip, like in Viz or, uh, I don't know any other hide type battle chips, will activate Search Soul. Like everything else in Battle Network 4, its utility is off the charts. The Mega Buster becomes a lock on cannon that automatically targets the opponent from anywhere on the field, even behind cover, and deals 50 damage. That'd be enough to warrant using the Soul, but it gets better. True to its name, you can use the Shuffle button up to three times per turn to search out different chips from your folder. Great for program advances. A top tier Soul indeed. I also spent some time gathering up better programs for my Navi Cust, so now I've gone from 500 HP to over 1000, cause we're coming up on the end here. After restoring all the connections, Mega Man finds the one responsible, and it's a generic heal Navi working for Nebula. Yay. Using Mega Man's <coughs> deletion as an excuse, Dr. Regal insists their plan goes ahead anyway, using his own Navi in Mega Man's stead.
final dungeon time already, but I was having so much fun. Ah, hold up, I see. The ground panels are like the faces on a die. I'm gonna have to cross them in the proper order. I didn't even touch anything that time. What the fuck? I clear the room, go to the next one, and for the love of internet Jesus, there it is again. What's causing this? It just sucks me in randomly and forces me to restart the room. This is insane. How is this even possible? It catches me before I get even halfway through the puzzle. Well, it isn't possible, as far as I can tell. The game is in an unwinnable state. This void will always appear before you activate all the platforms in this room, and if you don't activate all the platforms in one go, you can't continue. If it wasn't for the fact that the internet exists, this is where my playthrough would have ended. But, somewhat unfortunately, the internet does exist. Here's what I found. There is nothing, not one thing, within the game that tells you this. I checked. But what you're meant to do is mash the face buttons. I didn't check if it's A or B, I just hit both, when the black hole appears. If you're fast enough, Mega Man will pull himself out of the gravity well and you can keep going. Maybe Lan should, I don't know, fucking say something about that? How do you not have a text box or something that says, Hmm, maybe if you struggle hard enough you can break free, Mega Man. Or anything like that. Is this something that's lost in translation? When the black hole appears, Lance says to watch out for a powerful magnetic disturbance, which is a completely useless line of dialogue. Does the original Japanese version do a better job at hinting at what you're supposed to do? That's the only explanation I can think of. If I was a kid and I had infinite time, I'm sure I would have eventually slammed on the A button out of frustration and figured it out. But that's still not good game design. Laser Man is a meme of a penultimate boss. This is why I don't use program advances. I beat him in like 30 seconds, so let's make this quick. He's got a cross laser, a huge fuck off laser, and he can place a black hole tile that probably damages you or sticks you in place like a sand tile, and he's dead. Regal chastises Land for his actions, insisting that only Laser Man was strong enough to stop the asteroid. But... I beat him. How is he stronger than... Terrifying.
Dark Mega Man acts exactly like our little blue boy, only he can't use souls. He moves, attacks, and uses chips the same way that we do, so it's kind of like a PvP battle in a sense. If I knew anything about Voltron, I'd probably make a joke about this. Another day, another Battle Network final boss that can't be hit by half of my chip folder. Duo is another robot plucked straight from classic Mega Man. Mega Man 8 specifically, which makes this the second final boss in a row inspired by Mega Man 8. In that game, Duo was also an alien robot searching out evil in the universe, though the original Duo was a pretty cool guy who actually helped Mega Man stop Wily from harnessing the evil space energy. Not the case this time. And yeah, I died on my first attempt. Ten or so of my 30 chip slots were taken up by Heat Breath, Blizzard, and Time Bomb. All very powerful chips that I used to steamroll the rest of the game, which Duo cannot be hit by due to him lacking ground tiles beneath him. This means I had to die, change a bunch of chips, fight Dark Mega Man again, then get another go at it. This is the second time this has happened, and it's really fucking obnoxious. Sure, I was expecting a gimmick after the alpha ordeal, but how was I supposed to know what exactly to be prepared for unless I'd already fought him? Who knows what kind of form and attacks Duo would have? Who knew Duo would be the final boss? He comes out of nowhere. I'm not psychic. The other three final bosses weren't just floating in space. A final boss that's immune to a bunch of your attacks, attacks that work just fine on every other enemy in the game, isn't an intuitive design. The final boss is supposed to be a culmination of the skills you've learned throughout the game, so how does it make sense that dozens of otherwise helpful chips I've been using all this time are now basically empty slots? I don't mind changing my folder, really, but give me an option like in Kingdom Hearts 3, where when I die, I have the option to rearrange my folder, then immediately refight the boss, instead of being booted to the title screen, skipping through the cutscenes, and beating the underwhelmingly easy Dark Mega Man battle. This applies for all bosses in the series when I think about it. This would be a really cool optional feature to add to the inevitable Battle Network collection, like that checkpoint mode from the Zero one. On to Duo's actual strategy, cause things don't get much better. Duo is extremely similar to Alpha in the attack department. Big hand swings and lasers, as well as a core that is only temporarily open to damage. It doesn't sound that bad, but fans online generally look to be in agreement that Duo is the hardest final boss in the series, and I can see why. He's not a very smart boss, or a very strong boss, he's just a chore to deal with. You can only hurt Duo when his core turns red, and the hitbox is very fucking janky and strict. There are many times where I'm sure I hit him when it was red, but nothing happens. Not helped by the fact he's always moving, and endlessly firing projectiles from said core that block your shots. This all makes it very easy to accidentally waste one of your super powerful attacks on a whiff. He's also the only boss I can recall whose attacks are often flat out impossible to dodge. Aside from his laser, he can shoot missiles, launch swerving bombs, and smash into you with his fists. In the later half of the fight, he'll start doing all of those things simultaneously, and there sometimes simply won't be any openings to move out of the way. So I'd recommend saving your most powerful attacks for the end to blitz through that last stretch. Search Soul is really good for this fight, as it does 50 damage and targets the core automatically, 
but it'll still miss a lot because fuck you. The only problem with Search Soul is you'll have to open up the menu and waste turns for healing eventually. I did beat him on my second try, but it took a long ass time. And, if you're wondering, you aren't even given the option to use Dark Chips on him. Mega Man will never be tempted with Dark Chip data no matter how hard you get smacked up. So anyone who cheated their way here with Dark Chips is now fucked.
come on, it's the big dramatic finish. Proofread, goddammit. Alright, disaster averted for the fourth time. All that's left is to capture Dr. Eagle and end this game.